Hello, and welcome to a Cyberpunk Day exclusive interview with Mike Pondsmith. I'm Matthew A. Goodwin, an independent cyberpunk author, as well as a creator and co-founder of Cyberpunk Day, a celebration of all things uh, high-tech, low-life in the arts. I'm joined today by Mr. Stids, our resident tabletop gaming expert and ref, and of course, the man who killed your character in Cyberpunk, Mike Pondsmith. And when I say that, Mike, I am not just blowing smoke. I have here my original copy from when I was a kid, and you killed my <laughs> characters. So and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you had a good time dying. <laughs> I really did. And to the point where I now write Cyberpunk for a living and founded mm -hmm. a day to celebrate it. Um, Fantastic. I think the place that I really wanted to start is, um, you know, few people can say that they have had as much of an impact on a genre as you can say that you've had on cyberpunk. So what was it that drew you to this genre in the first place? Uh, and a word Blade Runner, actually. <laughs> um, I was interested in science fiction, but I was always interested in what was traditionally known as old school or um, hard science fiction, you know, Heinlein, Asimov, those guys. Okay. But I went to see Blade Runner one night and it was one of those points where I hadn't reached cult status yet. Nobody knew much about it. And I looked at the movie and I said, I either hate this or I love it. So I went back the next night and saw it again. And I decided, yeah, I love this. There was something amazingly both modern and very old encompassed in it the stories are strangely 30s 40s detective genre in many ways but they're also today or rather in that time today centered around the effects of technology the effects of change the values that we'll have in our future and it challenges all the old science fiction that i used to read it's still great science fiction, but cyberpunk gave me another way of looking at what science fiction could be. So I wrote the original cyberpunk 2020 with an eye towards creating what I saw on the screen in Blade Runner. And I soon realized that when you do an RPG, you have to answer a lot of questions that don't show up in a book. If you never have the hero go to the bathroom, then you don't have to worry about that in your novel. But you are going to have to worry about that if your players need to know whether they can sneak out the restroom window or not because the gangster's on the other side of the door. You have to know things that are in more depth than you would expect in a novel or a movie where the frame that the player works in, the viewer works in, is limited. So... Cyberpunk started out one way and it just tended to grow as I had to answer more and more questions. What do people eat? Where do they live? Who's on top? Who's on the bottom? Among the people on top, who's more on top than somebody else? All these things fit into a larger storyline. So that's kind of how I ended up being an inadvertent cyberpunk writer. Wow, that's a that's a really great answer. And did you see Blade Runner twenty forty nine when it came out? Oh yeah, yeah, first day. And? Definitely. Nice. Um, I actually had the advantage of I also had seen the uh, animation pieces that oh yeah came mm -hmm. before uh, twenty forty nine, so mm -hmm. I had more of a context to place it in. Um, the biggest problem that both Blade Runner and even more so with twenty forty nine. Um, is the problem of it's incredibly cerebral. You think mm -hmm. things with this movie. You don't mm -hmm. just go and absorb it. A lot of people think of cyberpunk as being blazing guns, cybernetics, you know, so forth. But those are the contexts in which a lot of really heavy thoughts go down. And Blade Runner brought those forward, but it wasn't going to be like an action movie. There was action, but it wasn't going to be in that same bam, 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 mm -hmm. always keeping you pumped. You had to stop and think about it. There were those moments when you looked out over the city and you said, okay, why is it like this? What am I doing here? Mm -hmm. So, well, and that's what I love the, the great thing. Mm. 
Yeah, I was just going to say one of the things that is so great about cyberpunk is that it does cut both ways is that you do have the incredible mm -hmm. action, but then something like Neuromancer, you kind of have to earn it through through some dense, some thick reading or with Blade Runner with um, some some ponderous scenes. And I think that's sort of it's great that it can cut both ways. I think it's important that it does. Otherwise, it's very superficial and you come to cyberpunk thinking it's going to be cool flying cars and metal hands but if you've done the right job you should walk away from there going hmm what does this mean to me what's it like to live in this world do i want to go there one day do i want to have this happen because one of the frames of cyberpunk is that this could be your future you might be on the road to this right now so it's a genre that's designed to make you think and because it makes you think it does demand more than the standard action film or just action genre you know in in a typical hard sci-fi story there's a premise there's an idea there's action there's usually some premise that's based somewhere in science fiction meeting the interface of real technology but cyberpunk technology is there. It's assumed it's more asking, okay, yeah, we're going to say that you've got cars that fly. Now, what does that mean? You know, what's the view I see when I get up? How do I get from A to B? Is the idea of these cars hurtling to a smoggy environment something I want to live with? Or, you know, Maybe I think that's cool. Me, you know, I like looking over cities. You know, the view over my shoulder is one that, you know, I would love to have. Unfortunately, I live in a forest, so it doesn't help. I think... Uh, well, it's especially with flying cars to think about, like, what about it being hacked? Mm -hmm. You know, any, oh, yeah. any one of these technologies that can be right. cool in a cyberpunk universe, there's also, and this is sort of what's great about cyberpunk, is it asks the question, what are the perils of, of this particular mm -hmm. technology? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think. You know. uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go on. Go on. No, I was just gonna say that uh, when when one mentions superficial, one thinks about Ghost in the Shell, Blade Runner, uh, those type of films that, at the end of the movie, just start thinking about what did really mean about this whole, you know, situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I love Blade Runner, but I also, for example, love Ghost in the Shell, particularly the uh, mm -hmm. original animation because of the moments that are still, the moments where the major, for example, is just stopping to look at a world she lives in and go, you know, my body isn't real. What's real is my soul in here. What does that mean? How much of my body is framing what my soul should be? And like I said, that's, that's asking a lot for someone to just sit down and kind of say, hey, I think I'll have a you know, cyberpunk experience. There it is. It's saying, yeah, you can have this experience, but there's going to be stuff in it we're going to ask you about and you're going to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so Matt, so we're good for the cyberpunk Greg questions? Absolutely. Go all for right. it. So we're going to be like back and forth here. So Matt will be doing all yeah. the cyberpunk genre questions. So... Um, so yeah, in regards of Cyberpunk Red, uh, the last short story, uh, Black Dog. Uh, Black Dog, yeah. Yeah, and by the way, I loved it, the characters, and especially the ending, which I won't spoil it for anybody, but <laughs> really good, didn't expect it. I, I, I worked very hard to get that ending to happen, because yeah. there were a lot of ways that that ending could be revealed. Yep. It was a roller coaster of emotions, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, in regards to Black Dog, more specifically the Cyber Six, um, mm -hmm. how did it come out in reaching the the people involved in those characters, and and what was the inspiration behind you know those characters, and you know delve with the story in Cyberpunk? I think it, this is you know like a couple of years back now, uh, we were already thinking about the idea that it would be interesting to get people who were on the forefront of prostheses and so forth. I follow a lot of how people utilize that technology because it's exploded and the capabilities are so amazing now. So I'm not sure whether um, it was Jay Gray 
or maybe, you know, one of somebody else in the crew came up with the idea of, we ought to actually, you know, talk to people and get their impressions if they happen to be using this technology. Mm-hmm. And it developed that the people we call the Cyber Six were a band as such. Uh, okay, they weren't literally a band, but they are a group of people who are already promoting basically alternative prostheses and what I would now call cybernetics and carrying that out to the world. And I went, okay, these are people who use this technology every day and they have a different way of looking at it. And this technology has changed tremendously from, you know, like when I was a kid or in college or whatever, where it was limited. Now it can do an amazing amount of things. And there are literally people out there who, for example, you know, um, they have, let's say, missing limbs like a leg, and they don't look at it just as, well, I've got to get a prosthesis and hobble around. They're selecting different types of legs for when they want to do things, looks and styles and capabilities. I need the legs I have that allow me to run faster than human beings should be able to run. It may look weird, but it works. I I can be used on bold all of a sudden, bam, you know. So we saw a picture of that group. And like I said, they look like a band. It was a great black and white picture. They're all standing there, Angel and everybody else. And we said, yeah, this is what we're talking about. People who are, you know, using technology, using cyberware, but these guys look cool. They look like what they would be like in this time and place. And so Jay Gray, who's our social media guy, got in touch with them. And we started talking about the idea of integrating them into the story of Black Dog. And it's fascinating because we let them build what they were like and how they utilized their tech, how they lived, what their you know backgrounds were. And then mm-hmm. I had to integrate that into the overall story that I was structuring. And they're great people. So they made great characters. Mm-hmm. And in fact, um, one of them, uh, oddly enough, was named Trace. And um, one of my characters from years back is the son of Nomad Santiago, and his name was Trace. And so all of a sudden, by perfect coincidence, I had Trace meeting up to play Trace. I said, okay, this was meant to be. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I mean, uh, I I know that in Cyberpunk Red, there's a sideline that has more info on the characters and the people Mm -hmm. behind it. Yeah, And uh, just reading those through, it's kind of inspiring just to know that these people actually have prostheses and are pretty much literally cyberpunks roaming around in our world. Yeah, exactly. And what I really like is the idea that they utilize those prostheses, as I Mm -hmm. see it, cyberware, as technology, but also as almost life enhancement. It's no longer Mm -hmm. a limit. It's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. It is. It is. Um, yeah. No. So, Matt, go for. Yeah, I mean that 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 conversation opens so many doors that I now want to just ask so many different yeah. cyberpunk <laughs> questions. I will stick to my questions, but it's it's this. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> the, it, this conversation is inherently. It speaks to why this genre is so great. We're already just discussing about you know the perils of technology, but then you guys are then talking about the flip side, you know, the positive, the inherent positivity that Mm -hmm. can be found in humans relationship with technology too. And I think that examination is another thing that makes the genre so great. It's not just focusing on the negative aspects. It tilts that way. It can sometimes be pessimistic, but it is also interesting to see the optimistic side. But for Mike, I got, I got to ask for somebody who's just starting cyberpunk, starting to learn about this genre a little bit, other than playing you know, 2077 and Cyberpunk Red, what are some properties that you would recommend to a new Cyberpunk fan? Well, you know, first of all, uh, I would definitely recommend that they see Blade Runner, if only to get the atmosphere and get the sense of what a world like that is like, because you need to envelop yourself in that kind of moody, um, 
totally absorbing environment you're in. You know, the closest you're going to get would be if somehow in Las Vegas, it rained a lot and they didn't, you know, have good sewers, you might get close, but we don't exactly have that world. So you need to immerse yourself in that space. Um, obviously, William Gibson, um, many, many years ago when I first ran across Gibson, it was actually, actually had written um, Cyberpunk at the time, the 20. 2013 version and then i found gibson and i remember sitting up at night reading it and looking at my life and going this guy's stuff is so good it makes my teeth hurt it's just like amazing so you want to take a look at those are the classics um i always recommend walter john williams hardwired uh mm -hmm. walter's friend who has contributed to our genre and he is a really great writer just generally but one of the best things walter brought to the party was the idea that you could be a hero in a cyberpunk world with agency. And cyberpunk characters, especially in Gibson, don't have a lot of agency. The world does stuff to them. They don't get to do stuff back to the world. Instead, it's, can I get out of this alive? Um, hardwired, the characters like Sarah and, and uh, Cowboy are basically characters who take the limitations of that world and they run with them and they take control of that. So it's another one. Um, beyond that, we have a really, really huge glossary of literally about a hundred books, and movies and so forth. You should probably check out that's in red. And we also have them up on the website as well for Talsorian. So mm -hmm. check those out if you're interested, but you want to get a visual and that's where Blade Runner comes in. And more so Blade Runner than uh, the later sequels, simply because it covers a very, very tight atmosphere. And 2049 has many other areas that happen in that space. And you're going to have to learn to sort out how people live cyberpunk in those other areas. You know, the difference between mass city environments that are crumbling and you're out in a, in a howling desert of orange sand and gigantic buried structures that look like the pyramids. That's a lot to absorb and put it into one form. So that's why I recommend Blade Runner. Besides which, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Blade Runner. I have every single version that was ever made. <laughs> so, you know, I have a Blade do Runner you, shelf up do you Do you read the comics? Mm hmm Yes. You do? Nice. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I read... stash all this stuff, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I still have my VHS of Blade Runner sitting next to my original CD-ROM of the Blade mm -hmm. Runner Westwood video game. Yeah. And it's all sitting in the my video, office, yes, the exact the, same thing. Yes, yeah, same, same here. But I've been trying because the system I used to run it on um, is, has died long ago. But I still have the game sitting up there on my Blade Runner shelf as well. Well, for a long time, it was one of the few cyberpunk games that mm -hmm. you can get your hands on. I mean, the genre oh, yeah. now, and, you know, in part thanks to you, the genre now has really, really in the last year, you know, exploded back onto the scene. But for a long time, mm -hmm. cyberpunk was sort of few and far between. And even now yeah. when people ask me what is cyberpunk, I can point to a handful of properties, but it's sort of yeah. one every decade that you can point to. Oh, The Matrix, Ready Player One. Like, you know, right. it, it, they're few and mm -hmm. far between. That feels like it's it's getting shorter. This year alone, we're getting mm -hmm. a bunch of cyberpunk properties. Oh, yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. things like Altered Carbon or, you know, I, I fell in love with Expanse, for example, because mm -hmm. oh, I yeah. said, finally, somebody's doing space cyberpunk, you know, and it's enough hard science to make sense. I accept what's going on there. But the elements, I mean, God, one of the main characters is effectively, you know, the hard-boiled private eye character. Who, and he's still like a stage up from looking at, you know, the characters in Blade Runner. And he has a more agency. But there's a lot of really good, solid cyberpunk. And I think what it is, is that people have grown used to the concepts. So they don't have to climb over this barrier. Instead... They're going, okay, I get this. I now know what I'm in. What are you going to say in this story? 
And so you can tell more stories because you're not having to teach people where you're going. They're not stopping and going, Ooh, look at that flying car go by. They're going, okay, flying cars, you know, rainy streets. Yeah, I get this. Now, what's your story? Where does this fit in? What questions will I ask myself? Yep, definitely. And I think uh, also just to add on that topic as well, mm -hmm. um, anime has also really evolved a lot with cyberpunk and sci-fi, like Psychopaths, uh, Ergo Proxy, yeah. and all those other shows that have really, you know, impacted the genre as well. And oh, yeah. a lot of people has been, you know, watching more anime as well. So, you know, so that also adds to the population of people watching Cyberpunk. Yeah, we, we started up, we start off with a lot of actually Japanese animation stuff built into what we're doing with Cyberpunk. Um, you know, if you go back and see the old Bubblegum Crisis, for example, you know, there's just a tremendous number of both homages and love letters to the genre as a whole. Um, so, once again, people have had bits fed to them, mm -hmm. and you'll occasionally see ads that call back to that environment or that idea of a cyberpunk world. But now I think it's it's enough um, rooted, kind of like the Western is now rooted. We know what the tropes are for the Western. Mm -hmm. There's now tropes for cyberpunk. And yeah. tropes are how cultures carry on their stories and they transmit their stories. They're sort of like, if, if you remember that old Star Trek, uh, Next Generation, where the, the guys all talk in metaphor, you know, Darmok and Gillard, you know, sort of thing. Memes and tropes are how cultures transmit how things feel, how they work, what the lines of the stories are, who the heroes and the villains are, and how you identify it. So we now have that dialogue as well established. And I think that's, you know, it's less what, you know, I've been doing or, you know, my, my buds over CD or so forth. I think it's also the culture is growing up enough to understand it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, continue on with the uh, second cyberpunk red question. Uh, and also this will be more like a yes or no question, but if you want to add more thought to it, by all means. But uh, so in regards to cyberpunk red uh, in the book, Never Fade Away, the short story, um, there has been a few changes from 2020 oh, yeah. to red. Uh, I mean, mo mostly the reason why is to be in line with the lore of 2077, um, I'm assuming, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's also because, remember, you know, I wrote mm -hmm. Never Fade Away long ago. And mm -hmm. as, you know, somebody over the crew here pointed out, you know, at the time when, when I wrote Never Fade Away, Johnny Silverhand would have been in a hair band, you know. He, he had a mullet, you know, he was, yep. but which for, you know, the 1980s, Johnny would be a total badass, but, you know, 25, 30 years have passed. And mm -hmm. one of the advantages to what we did in 2077 was we could update things to match up with what's cool now. And being able to do that meant that it was still relevant. It wasn't a, uh, an artifact of a different time where you can look at and go, yeah, this is like Knight Rider, man. You know, we, and I mentioned Knight Rider, you know, people are kind of chuckling like, oh yeah, a guy in his talking car and a whole bit like that, you know, mm -hmm. because it's framed and stuck in the time. Mm -hmm. And cyberpunk could have been that way too. By doing some of the changes we did never fade away, I was able to keep it essentially more timeless and bring certain things up to date. Um, one of the things that I also did was um, I changed the uh, lyrics and the bass songs that were in Never Fade Away. And part of that was, you know, at the time I was writing that and I was basically, you know, using synthesizers to write those songs and they were 80s songs. You know, mm -hmm. um, back then when I was writing it, it was more like, you know, some heavy metal and a little this and a little that and uh, maybe, you know, lover boy, <laughs> you know, 
And that music and that style would be, you know, the grandparents' style, you know. So I looked at it when they did the new music. I said, oh, this is pretty damn good. I'll just, you know, bring it into line because it does have to age. It has to change and be able to speak to people at the time that they're encountering it. So, yeah, that, that was going to be my question. So, oh, sorry, regard- I wrecked that. <laughs> No, no, no. Don't worry about it. So regardless whether Cyberpunk 2077 was going to happen or not, Never Fade Away was going to change regardless, just to be yeah. in its time. Okay. Yeah, it was going to it was going to have to evolve anyway. I always saw this as a, not even a trilogy, it's actually, it's, it's a four-part story of which one part's never been published. The first Johnny story is one called uh, The Punk in a Parking Space in which we meet Johnny. and He's just been in Night City for like about six months or so, having come out of the desert and the nomads. And he's riding, of all things, a Quadrophenia-like motorcycle. Mirrors all over the place, chrome, mm-hmm. a whole bit like that. And he is about to go into a parking space, and he's cut off by this guy in a Porsche. And the guy cuts him off and leans over and flips him off and a whole bit like that. So Johnny stops, gets off the bike, walks over, pulls out what will one day be the first ancestor of the Malar- Malarian. I'm sorry, Malorian. Malorian I, yeah. I do need more sleep. I invented <laughs> the gun and I can't say it today. At any rate, the ancestor of the Malorian, and that's a story in itself. And he shoots out all the tires. Of course, he says, looks over the guys. The guy's kind of like, Ugh! and he says, I figure since you wanted it so much, you should keep it points to the parking space and he walks off and there was a point of that story which was that you were living in an environment where casual violence of some guy pulling out a big honking handgun and blowing Mm. out your tires was not unexpected you know Mm. um and i actually have a thread that ran in there which i thought was pretty amusing which is that later in never fade away the porsche that he has Mm. is that same porsche Oh. He, he basically, by that point, bought it off this guy. And later, what you find out, Never Fade Away, is that one of the people who gets killed in a riot is the original owner of the Porsche. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it all kind of goes together. And uh, if you look around in uh, Samantha's garage yep. in Black Dog, mm-hmm. the Porsche is there. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. She's we we did not have at that point the rights worked out, and I was just amazingly flashed when CD managed to work something out with Porsche to actually do Johnny's car because uh-huh. it was you know they asked me what kind of Porsche and hoping I described to them you know, and they nailed it. It is yeah, yeah, that's what I had in mind at the time, but I know I I thought I'd never have Porsche agree to let me do this. They're mm-hmm. like, you're like this. We did this for the guard. It's cool. You know, and I said, yeah, okay. That's cool. I didn't know that. Um, wow. Yep. Now you got anything to add or? No, I just, I love these stories. I love hearing about the creation of these worlds. The, you know, as any cyberpunk creator, it's just, it's just really fun to listen to this. And it actually leads pretty well into my next question, which was what, what advice would you give to a cyberpunk content creator of any kind? Well, uh, there's a lot of different things. Obviously, you know, read and look. Um, Do not keep yourself limited to science fiction. Mm -hmm. Read and look at technology. But when you look at technology, ask yourself, what will the street do with this? You know, what will people do every day? You know, I'm fascinated because it's like, you know, when I talked about things like agents and all that, you know, this is somewhere in here. If you could see it, you know, cell phone. And I had one of the early cell phones way the hell back when I was writing the original cyberpunk stuff. And I was looking at the idea of how will people be able to use instantaneous communication, which is with them all the time. You know, they don't have to go to a phone booth. They don't have to go to an office. They can transmit, yeah, this is what it looks like or, you know, whatever. And I asked, what will people do with it? 
what will the average guy on the street do with this level of technology? So if you're writing cyberpunk, look around yourself at the technologies and say, okay, what would somebody in 10 years be doing with this? What would be the good parts? What would be the bad parts? Okay. Second, and more importantly, I actually think, is um, it's not about having the feel of the genre. You also have to have solid characters. Um, my wife, who also does some writing, you know, years ago told me something I've never forgotten, which is, you know, if you don't care about the characters, they won't care about the story at all. Your audience will not follow you. So, you know, in the end, you know, Never Fade Away, Black Dog, Fall of the Towers all work because mm -hmm. for all of his, you know, jerkiness occasionally, and, you know, Johnny can be a real rolling son of a bitch, but you kind of like it. You know, for all of that, you kind of go, yeah, there's that one guy that occasionally, like, I hang out with, and then we get drunk, and we do stuff, and there are moments when he says or does something that makes me want to punch him, but other times, I'm kind of okay with it. That's because, for all of that, Johnny is charismatic, and he does have certain principles. I wouldn't ever, if I were female, date him. <laughs> you know, I told my daughter, if you ever start dating someone like Johnny Silverhand, I'm going to lock you in a convent. <laughs> it's a bad idea, you know. But when you're writing cyberpunk, don't get hung up on the technology. Find out what your people are and take the technology in the world as it affects them, how they use it, how it changes their worldview, how it makes them different. So that would be about it, I'd say. Beyond that, write every day, as my grandmother told me a long time ago. Every day, write, my book. <laughs> yeah, and you'll never go wrong if you're focusing on characters. I mean, in, in some ways, all storytelling is mm -hmm. just characters with different paint jobs, you know? Yep. Beyond that. Um, so just uh, pretty much go for the semi-final cyberpunk red question that i got that uh i'm a little curious about as well mm -hmm. uh i'm pretty sure you've been working on the dlcs lately for cyberpunk red uh elo yeah. the hardy nukes um so with the release with uh elo and specifically uh elf lines online yeah which anybody has uh, been uh, playing which is great, by the way, which gives a good change of pace for Cyberpunk in itself. So, <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, Elf Alliance Online is, is, I did not create that. That was actually a brainchild of one of our, our staff crew writers, and uh, oh, okay. James Hutt. And he came to me with this idea, and I went, this is just so crazy. Do it. You know, you have, <laughs> you have my blessing. Go do this. So, you know, we've actually been talking in the office about not just how to expand Elf Lines, because it has a lot of fun stuff, but where it roots in the world of cyberpunk and what other similar things are like that out there. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you live in a horrible environment, pretend actually becomes a really fun thing to do. You're getting out of the really lousy environment. Right. So... When I read through the DLC, it got it got uh, like a lot of ideas from probably the Matrix or other mm -hmm. uh, like hacking uh, simulations that you can live in in a cyberpunk world. So the mm -hmm. only thing I thought about when I read that is, will net running chairs be back soon? We'll be yes. seeing them soon. Maybe new mechanics or so. Do you have any ideas when that was brought up? Maybe. Um. We worked net running out and we made changes. And I spent a ridiculous amount of time researching this. And luckily I had a lot of friends out of Microsoft. So I could pick their brains and I dealt with code that I did and so forth like that. And one of the reasons the net is the way it is, is a structural problem of a tabletop RPG. The net running system before was very, very Gibson-esque. Interestingly enough, it was uh, affected more by Walter's contributions because Walter had built a net system that operated within hardwired as well. But it was dealing with a meta universe. And that was because all of those characters 
were mostly working in that meta universe. So they're all there. Cyberpunk, you know, coming out of the 13 to the 2020 period, you've got people with all kinds of jobs who are now thrown together and it becomes really hard to run a game when one guy is not in the middle of the action. So I had to structure it in a way where net running was going to allow the net runner to be with the action. They couldn't sit there and, you know, be mm-hmm. talking to a headset and say, go down the corridor because they were not in sharp end. So one of the other things that came about on this was a discussion with a couple of friends of mine who um, basically do security and computer firms. That's what their gig is. And, mm-hmm. you know, they looked at what went down in the fourth corporate war and they said, this is ridiculous. They've got this open system and they don't have any, you know, way to air gap it and everything is connected to everything. No wonder these guys got messed up during the fourth corporate war. You know, they, they have no security is what he was pointing out. For all your talk about ICE and all that, Mike, no security here. So I sat down with him and said, okay, so I've had a war. How do I rebuild, you know, the internet? And, you know, one of them sort of said, okay, well, one, everything is air gapped because you don't want it to jump around. Think of it like a plague. And mm-hmm. things are going to be tighter and smaller. And there is going to be a big gap in your internet that is not commercial because mm-hmm. even if there are people still logging on to buy things or whatever, the, um, the far side of that equation is delivery and supply and so forth. So, yeah, I can go on the equivalent of, you know, uh, cyberpunk Amazon, but post-war, getting the box of Amazon stuff that I just ordered may be next to impossible. You know, if, mm-hmm. if they weren't hijacked and route to your house. I mean, come on, think about it this way. We have porch pirates now. Imagine if the porch pirates are driving through your neighborhood and when they see the Amazon truck, they hold it up, shoot out the tires, rip everything out of the back of the van and take off and leave the van burning. Mm-hmm. That's what you're looking at in, in you know, post-war cyberpunk. So you will eventually see net running chairs and that sort of thing creeping in but it will be like resurrecting a lost technology okay and part of that is at the time there's not really a need to build one of those sweeping nets like something out of you know the old movie hackers where you know you you Mm -hmm. kind of flew through everything and icons were there you know we don't need that right now what we need is being able to transfer files around an office building or a complex and make sure that nobody puts something horrible into your system so that your entire network blows up. Mm-hmm. So that's something that's going to be up here in 2077. Uh, yeah. Well, 2077, um, we know generally what we want to do with the net. We, we've used part of it. Um, mm-hmm. But I spent... Um, a lot a lot of time with adam uh talking he's one of the uh, leaders over there at Mm -hmm. uh the team and he and i spent a lot of time you know arguing about what was going to happen with the net how far did it reach you Mm -hmm. know and you'll notice that weirdly enough the net exists but its space is pretty much locked down to the environs of night city you know, no mm-hmm. one's saying, I'm going to Europe now, psh, into the net. You know, they're not doing that. And that was because, you know, a large part of what we discussed was how do we keep this grounded and keep the players in the same room, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Give them the same threats and possibilities. Okay. So it's more of a mechanics type of... It's- it was mechanics and also, like I said, we, as somebody said in an interview a long time ago, they were saying, you know, William Gibson didn't really know a whole heck of a lot about computers at the time when he wrote a lot of the stuff in Neuromancer. And that's not too surprising. At that time, nobody really knew a lot about that, you know. Mm. 
so it would it was kind of like you know undetermined space and you could describe it any way you wanted um but now in the context of you know computer hacking you know ransomware malware um you know cryptocurrencies all these things that are now part of our universe the idea of a wide open you fly around and go you know to places through icons in the net you know am i really going to spend all of that processing time to render a beautiful flashing light environment no you know that's like you know i need to use my phone i pull my phone up and i have to go through a you know loading screen that's five minutes of really cool stuff the second time i do that it's getting old the third time i want to throw the phone against the wall so yep. we kind of took net running and made it more real and it mm -hmm. solved both the problem of a mechanics structure, but it also solved uh, bringing net running into something that was actually relatable in a world where there now is a net and we use it and people have expectations. You know, when, when I created agents, which strangely enough, I, I came up with agents back for a version of uh, called Cyberpunk Green or... Uh, Cyberpunk 2030X. And agents were, you know, this idea of you you got micro programs and you could tell your agent like a small pocket computer how to do a lot of things in your life. And as my son pointed out, you know, a few years later, he's looking at this and he says, you pretty much invented the smartphone, you know, in terms of as a concept, which was, you know, the smartphones we have are basically pocket computers that are shaped by the stuff, the apps that we shove into them. And mo much of the stuff I have going on now with agents is a higher, somewhat higher level version of appware, really. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's something that people can look at and they would expect it. They go, why can't I do that? I can do it with my phone now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, agents does bring a lot of like opportunities Mm -hmm. creative ways with players when they're playing a session like uh for example the the play the one shot that we're doing for cyberpunk day our fixer pretty much saved the day in their contacts and the information gathering and and the agents was pretty much uh their tool and just getting all those uh stuff in their hands like grenades and mm -hmm. uh, vehicles and stuff like that and yeah agents are pretty cool especially if you have an AI integrity uh, and part of it, the agent. So mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. Yeah. I like the idea of AIs now being, you know, usable in a way that a genie would be in an old Arabian nights tale. It can do a lot of things. It's very powerful. And if you screw up and give it an opportunity, it will kill you or enslave you or do something horrible to you just mm -hmm. because it can. So, yeah. Um, you can do a lot. In fact, the interesting thing about Red is that Red talks a lot about economics, how we get things, how we trade, how we use money, you know, why a corporation is more powerful. And a lot of that can be done now because people who play are more familiar, again, with the tropes of cyberpunk. So before I had to sell people an idea of a mega corporation like Arasaka... No, I'm not answering that. Um, I'd have to talk, you know, teach them the idea that there could be a corporation that big, that powerful. Now they know it exists and they know that concept. So now I can say, and this is why it's this powerful. And this is how it became this powerful. And here are how subsidiaries work. And here's how black ops work and all that, because they've got the first steps. So it's pretty easy to make the next steps. Yep. So I, I just just makes me want to ask. I, I I'm sure. gonna go off off script here. I, I do have to just ask: Is there any piece of technology that you've created that you're just particularly proud of, or fond of, or something that? <laughs> oh man. Hmm. Uh, there's question. a lot of a lot of just kind of bits and pieces. I couldn't say one, 
because all of them have kind of a cool way of being used. You know, it's mm -hmm. like agents are cool, but a lot of the weapon systems were also cool. Um, because I had to think around the corners of, you know, like what would somebody in 20 years come up with as a gun or whatever they would use. I really couldn't say there's a specific favorite. I, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, that old joke about picking which kid you like the most, you know, there's a lot of things in that world that I just really love, mm. you know. Well, and you've seen a lot of those technologies come to pass in, yes. in the intervening time. I mean, one of the things of cyberpunk is the world has caught up with a lot of these things that seem mm -hmm. so futuristic in the past, you know, going through Disney World and seeing, oh my gosh, they're talking, you know, yeah. via Futurama. computers to one another and here we are. Yeah, Futurama time. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because now a lot of what we've been doing with cyberpunk has been to actually not lean on the technology, but to actually talk more about, okay, how are people in this world using this technology? What are they doing with it? Because we can't lean on the, it's going to be really cool because it's science fiction. You know, <laughs> people are going to go, well, you know, it's like... Um, electric cars we make this assumption back then you know this is the future we'll have electric cars you know and reality is we have electric cars and they work pretty well and more and more people are getting them so that's not really cool science fiction anymore but there's a lot of questions about how do you fit those cars into that world? What happened to the guys who were making the oil? What ha where did all that oil go to? You know, what does this say about power resources and energy? Because energy determines what a civilization can do and where it's going to go. All those things are sitting or encompassed in that, in that electric you know, car. And before, we were just busy going, whoa, electric car. Cool. You know, that's the future. And now, you know, well, for starters, for me, it's, did I plug the car in last night? Yeah, that's right, I did, you know. I mean, literally, I go, I look at my phone. I look at my phone, I find out my car is plugged in or not, you know. Oh, okay. Cyberpunk is now. <laughs> it's now, you know, I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my phone and, you know, I'm checking it out and going, oh, my investments are here. My car is plugged in. What's going on in the office, you know. And this conversation we're having. You know, the idea of Zoom, we, we've done things like this in Tal Sorting for years, but we didn't think that an entire freaking civilization would be running off of Zoom calls. And trust me, you didn't either. <laughs> you know, yep. we were all standing around going, well, thank God, Zoom should be the most powerful corporation on earth <laughs> instead of TikTok. Yeah, it was funny when I was creating um, my cyberpunk world, I was trying to figure out a way of why it was that all of the people were living in these mega cities and not mm -hmm. out in the toxic waste. And so I was just coming up with a history of my world and I thought, okay, mm -hmm. I'll just, um, I'll just call this, this event that preceded my world. I'll just call it the great pandemic. And that's why people are all working, working from home and, and they live in corporate owned housing. That seems to make sense. And, you mm -hmm. know, two years later, the world showed me what was what. Yeah, that's that's the problem in many ways is that if you hang something on a particular event, reality may catch up to you and you suddenly find it's crowding you and you don't have as much room. So, yeah, technology becomes a problem. It can be, you know, literally a millstone around your neck, particularly if that technology, you, you've, you've made the centerpiece of whatever you're doing. It's like, zip, there it is. I mean... Here's a fascinating one. We were talking earlier about um, the cyber six, as I, I like to call them. And mm -hmm. um, we're talking about prostheses, okay? And what I find more fascinating is not that you can do more and more with them, but there are, for example, one of the charities that uh, we're contributing to in the name of the crew is um, basically makes prosthet prosthetic arms for kids that's cool in itself because normally that would be really really expensive but they do it on 3d printers so it just got cheaper and then they make the technology and the 
uh, SCL files that you can make those arms available to anyone who wants them. So all of a sudden, your kid who may have lost an arm or was born without one is no longer just, yeah, we've got this really funky looking, you know, thing that's an appendage to make up for it. No, he can get his own arm, get it done the way he wants. You know, if he wants to have his arm look like Iron Man, he can damn well do it, you know. And so all of a sudden it becomes, whoa, this is cool. And I can personalize it. I have agency in this. And my parents aren't spending mil you know, thousands of dollars to get this. They're downloading this. And if they're, you know, skilled enough and lucky enough to have access to one, which most of us can now, they can get my arm 3D printed. And when I outgrow it, I'll 3D print a new one. You know, mm -hmm. that's really amazing because what it does is it takes technologies that were accessible to only a few people or large corporations and it drops it right on the street where anybody can use it. And that's a big question to ask. What happens when technology is that accessible to the street? You know, it well, really this does. This leads me actually, the last question I had for you um, uh -huh. was, you know, cyberpunk tends to act as a sort of a cautionary tale about man's relationship with yeah. technology. They're going to, they're going to put it on my, my headstone. It's going to say cyberpunk was not supposed to be an aspiration. It was a warning. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I may have quoted you saying that the other night in a cyberpunk round table, we were recording for cyberpunk day. Yes. Um, so I, I, I was going to ask if, if you sort of believe that technology is going to be this thing that curses us, or are we going to be able to hopefully wrangle technology to sort of save us from ourselves? Um, we can do it. And the technologies are there. The problem is, uh, as Robert Heinlein said many, many years ago in the notebooks of Lazarus Long, um, there may be 1% of humanity makes the steps forward and drags the rest of humanity kicking and screaming into the future. And I, I've always modified that to say, you know, there's 1% that's doing that doing the breakthroughs, and then there's another 10% that are going, hmm, you found atomic power. I bet I can make a damn cool bomb with that. And they find a use for it. So the problem we're going to have with technology, even as it hits the street, is thinking a little bit further ahead what we plan to do with it. We can't just make assumptions and it's not going to be something that's handed down on high by powerful people who theoretically thought about it more than you did. So that means that we can save ourselves possibly, but we have to decide how we want to be saved, what we want to do. We want to see what the outcomes are. We're going to have to get past people who would rather use that technology for their own benefits we're going to find different people doing different things that may go head to head opposite of each other in terms of the use of that technology. And so I always look at tech the way I, I look at the uh, pocket knife I carry, okay, which is I use it, I have this pocket knife and I use it to open packages, screw in screws, punch small holes in things. I'm trying to put something up on a wall, you know. It's a tool. I can also use it and kill somebody, theoretically. Not that I'm planning to. But the whole point is that knife in itself, just like any other technology, doesn't have an agenda and it doesn't have a use that it must be used at. And that's any technology. So... Answer is, we can fix things. We might even be able to build something that isn't a Blade Runner reality. We build something that did come out of, you know, future, Futurama or something. But what we are going to have to do is think about how we want to get there and what we want in the end. And how we're going to get everybody to agree on it 
and how we're going to make sure that some people don't misuse it. And that's always the catch of technology. Yeah, it's that choice between do you want to live in Blade Runner or Wakanda in the future? <laughs> Me? I'd I, that was one another movie that I, I love because I looked at Wakanda and I said, more than anything, it's not the cool tech that they have, but how well that tech is integrated to how those people would be living. They're not like uprooted, changed, and moved to a Western-based society. There's still an African society that happens to have high tech, you know. Um, well, and it's nice to see the high tech, the similar high techs that you see in cyberpunk, but being used not mm -hmm. by scumbags, but by people trying to do better for the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we can't necessarily agree on, you know, who are really the scumbags and who are the good guys, you know. Um, I saw something the other day uh, on one of my news feeds that said, you know, don't count on billionaires to save humanity. I'm kind of going, well, yeah, probably not. But, you know, there are some guys who are jerks and there's some guys that are actually getting it done. They're making a ton of money doing it, but they're doing the job of improving a particular situation. They just figure, you know, if I do this, I'll also be richer. So once again, you know, technology is like the knife. You can open packages or you can, you know, go jack the ripper on somebody. Um, you need to know, though, one, what your choices are and to also realize that your knife may need to be different things. It may have different, you know, what is the job I want this to do? Um for example, you know, uh, I would not use my jackknife to, uh, I don't know, uh, trim meat or cook with, you know. But it's great for opening a package, you know. And I don't know how many times I have been stuck in some situation where it was like I need a, a borehole for something or I need, you know, to, to leave a mark on, a, you know, a post or a tree or whatever. It does that job. Cyberware will do that job. And out of that, you can, you know, have some great cyberware or you can be Adam Smasher. It's up to us. Um, I was reading an article where they mentioned, I forgot the name of the paradox, but it was a paradox where uh, we create technology to, to make things easier for us, to make things done quicker. But in reality, that's not the case. We actually use technology to, to waste time, to look at social media, to look at pictures, to look at videos. And I was reading this article and I was referring to this paradox where we're creating technology not to make things easier, but to waste time. And I just remembered that you were saying that about the pocket knife, like, okay, yeah, it makes sense, you know, the analogy and the differences. And, and yeah, hopefully that doesn't turn, you know, into a Blade Runner future when we continue doing that type of uh, idea. So, well, yeah, there's there's that you know thing of you know when I was a kid, you know, you you were hearing kids watch too much TV, you know, and it's you know going to turn them into a giant eye in the middle of their forehead. And <laughs> now, pretty much every kid in Western culture has access to a little tiny TV that not only can play, you know cartoons or you know weird stuff but has access to all the knowledge of humanity all the news humanity is current doing instant communication across the globe to people maybe they shouldn't be talking to and of mm -hmm. course or all the porn in the universe <laughs> you know when when people started actually uploading porn into the net i said okay now we have arrived humanity has taken its next to food most favorite thing and has moved it into the rest of its life but um yeah that line but also in the last year made it possible for kids to go to school in a situation that they might not have otherwise been able to it, or have this conversation or have this conversation which is just remarkable from all over the world right now well you and i are pretty close mike but just to have um this conversation it's absolutely remarkable yeah, it's what fascinates me is like, you know, people use it for different things. Um, it's like, you know, my wife and I are constantly cruising through um, not just all the documentaries and things that are showing up on the net, but YouTube is in a phenomenal place to learn practical and useful stuff. And so 
we use it in a way that we people used to use television. And then between my friends, my family, you know, everybody in the circle around me all share that information as they come across it. You know, it, it always cracks me up when, you know, I'll, I'll be talking, let's say my son, and we'll be, you know, discussing something or other. And I'll go, yeah, they had this on whatever. And I'll go, yeah, that, that was pretty good. And he'll go, you watch that? And I go, yeah, you watch that? <laughs> well, you know, we both have an interest in certain topics and it's going to pop up. But that access is now there. He's watching it, you know, two in the morning when he's bored out of his tree or something. I'm watching it as I'm, you know, eating dinner. And mm -hmm. we're still getting the same information and knowledge. But we now have selectivity. We can pick when we want to get that. And there are other people who are probably out there watching, you know, the joke is always cat videos. But, you know, um, I have a friend who watches pimple popping videos. Mm. You know, but this whole show their... is dedicated to it. <laughs> yeah. And it makes their day. And I'm just kind of going, okay, that's your thing. Enjoy it. You know, I'm not going to join you and I'm not going to have you make dinner. <laughs> Yeah, every niche now has a voice at this point. Yes, and sometimes, you know, you have to realize the people who have, have those niches, you may not want them to have a niche, you know. <laughs> you may be looking at stuff and going, yeah, this is not a good idea, you know. So we're going to have to ask ourselves, you know, where do we want the culture to go to? You know, I actually love one thing about 2077 that I was not able to do as well, I believe, in the 2020 period and that is to show the ubiquitous the ubiquitous quality of media you know it's all over it's everywhere and it's not always good you know um a lot of the ads and stuff you see in that version of night city you know are downright offensive but that's important to know that it wouldn't all be Jetsons. It would be some pretty terrible stuff. And somewhere along the line, somebody decided, yeah, that's a great idea for an ad. You know, we'll show somebody being beheaded. That'll be cool. Oh, geez, no. You know, we'll show this. We'll do this. We'll teach this. We'll proselytize this value. And we'll just throw it out there in a enormous universal stew pot that my five-year-old can access with his phone. Yeah, okay, you better start thinking about it before you let that happen. You may not, you know, stop it, but you at least want to know it's, you know, a possibility where you're going. Well, that's, I think, one of the, the great things about 2077 was that it, it takes that, you know, the neon aesthetic, the bright aesthetic, but it also makes it perfectly oppressive in a very yes. sort of vital now cyberpunk sort of way. You walk into mm. any room and you're hearing the television in that room. Yeah. And it's and it's pretty true to real life too. If you're even on the bus or anywhere, there's somebody's phone going on, that you're always mm -hmm. surrounded by noise. And I noticed that I 100% in 2077. So like I, I got nice and deep into that world. Yeah. And it was one of the things that I noticed was just the sound. And it was so true to a, a cyberpunk future i love that yeah i love i love the fact that you can wander around. i i just wander around night city you know a bunch of times um because that's fun you know it's an environment that's worth exploring you find a lot of weird things there that they you know you know somebody said yeah this would be really cool i wonder if anyone will ever go down this alleyway mm -hmm. at this time and see this one thing i've set up as a trigger wow that was insane but um one of the things I noticed is, yeah, it's never quiet. Even mm -hmm. at the dead of night, in the distance, you hear stuff. And it made me think, because like a couple of weeks ago, I went on vacation, and I went out to an area way out on the coast where there really isn't a whole lot. There's like one road, you know, and a lot of beaches. And I remember at some point getting out of the car and commenting to my wife, damn, it's quiet. There wasn't anything flying overhead. There wasn't anything on the road. It was too small. You know, there wasn't anybody playing music. And I went, you know, we don't exist in a world that's quiet these days. We exist in a world where 
there is stuff impinging on us all the time. You know, and our brains never get a rest. You know? Yeah, in early 20... In yes, early 2020, I remember walking the streets of San Francisco, you know, just to get my kid out of the house. And I noticed that I heard more bird songs. And it mm -hmm. was because there were no cars driving. Yes. The city was destitute. So it was just, it was just, you could hear those few birds singing in the trees nearby. And it was n noticeable. Yeah, I, I, I was fascinated by the fact that um, you're in San Francisco area. Um when the Loma Prieta quake went down and all the freeways were down and you couldn't get across the Bay Bridge and all that, how still the world was. And, you know, I, I had to go into San Francisco and go all the way around to get there. But I was fascinated by the fact that cities can be very, very quiet and there's a lot of nature going on if you don't have a million cars and people talking. Well, it and, also make Loma Prieta also made you realize how quickly everything can be destroyed. How we yes. build all this infrastructure. Of course, I was young at the time, but I remember it so distinctly. And it 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 just reminds you how fragile every everything mm -hmm. is in a certain way. Well, that was the whole point of having the fourth corporate war. Was and we we are talking more and more about that as we explore the red universe. Is mm -hmm. um how infrastructure breaks down, how supply chains break down, how communications break down. I, I'll give you a case. Um, we were researching for the war and we realized at the time that roughly at that point, 80% of everything we deal with, the computer I'm talking to you on, you know, the drink I'm drinking, the glass that was made, you know, somewhere, that's all shipped. It's all moved. All that stuff is thrown on a huge ship, taken from A to B. But if you can't fuel the ships, stuff doesn't get there. If you can't operate the loading platforms to get the stuff on trucks or trains, you don't get it. If you can't get the lithium to make the batteries in Hong Kong to put in the phone that's made in Seoul, Korea to get on the boat, you know, and travel across to, you know, some other point. All those connections are all there. We just take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the big one for me was realizing, you know, after years of thinking, Oh, well, you know, communications, they've got satellites up there. That's what's doing it. Finding out 70 to 80 percent of our communications, maybe higher now, isn't up there in space. It's literally in cables running into the ocean. And which occasionally, like something about a month ago, somebody drove their ship across a cable and cut off half of Australia. <laughs> you know, and you're like, Wait, that technology was invented back in like the 1890s and we're still doing it that way, you know. And that's fascinating because we live on the edge of a precipice on technologies that very few of us ever notice or understand. You know, that is a terrifying and cool thing. And it's also a thing where it takes a lot less than you would think to make the whole thing break down. So, you know, I had a world war and it broke down. Mm -hmm. Well, and it reminds me of the Jurassic Park quote that, you know, we were advancing technology so fast that we were thinking about if we could and not stopping to think if mm -hmm. we should. And, it, you know, with how technology is advancing, I mean, you know, technology was moving like this and now it's just, you know, every six months, the iterations are so different between now and ancient societies, you know, ancient Rome, where it was a new mm -hmm. armor 300 years apart. And now it's, you know, your, your phone intentionally starts to die so that you're forced to buy the next iteration and you've already missed two phones in the meantime. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fascinating. I, I've gotten into real interest on ancient history. Um, and one of the things that fascinates me is how long and stable things are. You know, it's like, I was studying, I'm studying the Bronze Age collapse. 
And they're going, okay, by the time we got around to the Bronze Age collapse, there have been like two or three different dynasties in Egypt. And the pyramids had already been built and were a thousand years old by the time of the Bronze Age collapse. And they're still using the same boats. They're still eating the same stuff. They've still got roughly the same religions and hierarchies and pharaohs. And they're writing things down on papyrus, you know, for the last 1,500 years. And, you know, you, you start talking to people, you know, like, America, it's been around for 200 years. And you're going, dude, you have no idea what a short period of time it is and how much has happened in that period, as opposed to walk over there, look at those old Egyptians. That was the 1,500 years, sitting around, doing the same thing. You know, yeah, ancient and that Egypt was me. older to the ancient Romans than ancient Romans are to us. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was talking to another friend about this the other day and, you know, they're going, well, how, how could people lose that technology in like a generation or whatever? And I said, we can't build Saturn V rockets now. We don't know how. And that's like, you know, the people who are in that generation are alive. You know, I've, I've got a couple of friends who, you know, actually do, um, work at rocket firms and they're going yeah you know we build new stuff but we don't know how they did that because half of it was a clutch and mm -hmm. i'm thinking okay so you're you're about 60 now you know and you've worked on nasa stuff and do you think anybody out there will remember or know how to build what you guys built to go to the moon and we're going to have to start all over again you know um there's something I read not too long ago which stated that basically human memory as a culture is usually about two generations. You remember what your grandparents did and you know what your parents did and you know what you did, but you don't have any idea what your great grandparents did. You know, you, you, mm -hmm. you, it's an abstract history to you. It's, it's not quite the Romans, but it's almost, you know, um, you know, try to imagine um you know our modern jet age and go okay there was a time when a b-25 bomber was like the thing you know it was you know totally badass i went for a flight in one of those several years back and i'm looking and going okay so this actually goes up in the air and people you know went from a to b and you know the guy flying and said yeah we fought wars there and i'm like yeah okay half the half the bravery of the wartime was just i got in this thing right. <laughs> and you know i flew across an endless ocean and i dropped bombs and hopefully got back home you know and now i could get in a jet bomber and i could fly over there drop a bomb and fly back and probably be back in time for dinner hmm. yeah, it's kind of amazing and Mike, I guess before I let you go, is there anything that you um, wanted to tell our Cyberpunk Day community? Anything you got upcoming or anything you wanted to, to talk about while we got you? Well, okay. We're doing a whole lot of really interesting and exciting stuff for Cyberpunk mm -hmm. Red. You're going to be learning more and more about it as the uh, year goes on. We have a couple new products that are coming out to make that more interesting and easier to use, kind of get involved with that world. Um, the other thing is we are looking at trying to get what we're doing into other media forms. So, you know, more online presence, more, you know, storytelling presence. So stick around for that. And uh, the other thing is I'm banging away working with some of the guys over CD and we're dreaming up some new stuff over there. So we're, we're busy, you know, and uh, is, that means we, we stay out of trouble. Is that a, is that a hint for a 2077 source book or, or uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so close mr sid so close i okay. could i could say something and then jay gray would appear out of the computer and kill me <laughs> they'll make me edit that right out yeah all right well thank you so much for coming on and uh no I, it's, it seems weird to say happy cyberpunk day but thank you so much <laughs> for joining us on cyberpunk day oh well yep. thank you for having me i appreciate it and have a good cyberpunk day all of you out there okay
Thanks. Awesome.